because I was in Washington in the 60s and 70s, a lot of what Elman and you talked about I knew, but I think most people wouldn't, and there was stuff that I didn't. So, uh, it, you know, it, it, proves, uh, it proves very valuable. And I was in the department in the early to mid-60s. And uh, from the, the roughly the 30s and 40s on, when a lot of Jews and a lot of Catholics began to go to and graduate from law school, they gravitated in untold numbers, untoward numbers, to the Department of Justice because the private law firms wouldn't have them. And um, so the department got some of the very best talent in the country. And in those days, it was highly, it was, uh, you know, I don't know what it is today. I don't opine one way or the other, and I don't know. But in those days, it was very, very highly thought of. And here's a funny but true story. When, when Edward Levi became the Attorney General and Bork was the Solicitor General, Levi once said to Bork, hey, find out for me why the quality of the department's lawyering has gone down. And Bork asked around and inquired, and came back and said, because the private firms are taking Jews. Hmm. And he says, you know, when the, when the private firms began to take the Catholics and the Jews, that had an impact. You know, that's a story about, um, Alan Greenspan told the story about how he built his firm, um, his consulting firm. And he took advantage of the fact that women were not being hired at the other Wall Street firms. Uh -huh format that of the book that you used. It, you have many notes yeah. that elaborate and explain what is talked about in the transcript itself on the theory that, and it's a very good theory, uh, it being so many years, 40 and 50 years from some of the events that Elman was talking about, people often won't know who the individuals are who are mentioned, or what the events are that were mentioned, and yet they're of the mm -hmm. essence both to Elman's life and career, and in cases like Brown versus the Board of Education to American history. It would take a landmark decision by the United States Supreme Court to overturn the laws that kept black children separate from white children in schools. Roy Wilkins worked with Thurgood Marshall and other NAACP lawyers to devise a strategy for a Supreme Court test. They enlisted expert witnesses who testified about the psychological and social harm of segregation to black children. They argued that racial segregation in the schools violated the United States Constitution. On May 17, 1954, the court handed down a momentous decision. In the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. The cases began to come up. There were five or six of them, all heard together, and decided under the rubric Brown versus Board of Education. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to talk about Phil's role in that. What, what, uh, what occurred because Perlman quit? Whether he was uh, one step ahead of the posse or not, that's another story. But things changed because uh, of, uh, because he quit. And Phil's, uh, and there's been enormous amounts of discussion over the years uh, of the uh, relic roles and the connections between Phil and Frankfurt are having to do with Brown versus the Board of Education. It's a 10 or 15 minute story, feel free. Let's start with the prehistory. Um, there were cases brought in this struggle for civil rights that, um, um, that were sustained and nourished by the NAACP. There were cases challenging discrimination in graduate schools and professional schools. Right. Um, there was uh, a case called Sweat v. Painter which, uh, in which the Supreme Court held that um, a, a law school was not equal, uh, a black law school was not equal to a white law school. They, they, didn't they try to give that guy like his own room? <laughs> right, or sit him in the back of the, <laughs> yeah. of, of the class. 
and and um, and then there was another case, um, and there was another case called McLaurin. Yeah. And um, and again, uh, both of these cases were cases which were leading to um, were leading toward a challenge to the doctrine of separate but equal in some ways, but in in most respects, uh, uh, they were really testing the equality part. They were testing the equality part of this notion. They were they were saying that the facilities that the black um, that the black student had was not uh, uh, those, those facilities were not equal. Let me interject something. Yeah, Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP knew, did they not, that if they just marched forward head on into battle, saying overturn Plessy versus Ferguson is. Uh, and declare that separate is never equal, equal, they were dead bang losers. So what they did is they, they created a strategy that will chip away. They'll say, mm -hmm. it's not equal here, it's not equal there, mm -hmm. it's not equal in mm -hmm. third place. After f eight or nine of those cases, you begin to get, you can get people thinking, well, gee, is this never equal anywhere? Mm -hmm. But go mm -hmm. ahead. The court was never presented in those cases with the proposition that separate was inherently unequal. Or at least no case dependent on that proposition. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. I mean, um, uh, it, it was, it, it, the Henderson case, which I told you about earlier, was really, as far as I understand, um, the first case in which, in which, certainly it was the first case in which the federal government, uh, U.S. government argued it, um, that, uh, that essentially separate but equal was unconstitutional, the treatment of separate, uh, the use of uh, separate but equal facilities. Yeah. Yeah. Around this time, we're, we're talking about around 1950, um, the, the NAACP began to bring cases uh, involving public elementary schools. And you asked me about Philip Perlman. The, um, in, the early, in those cases involving the graduate schools, after, um, after Shelley versus Kramer, um, Philip Perlman uh, uh, found out that he actually um, received a great deal of praise for having argued that case, and he signed on. He supported filing amicus briefs in those other cases involving graduate schools. In 1950, around 1950, when the NAACP started to bring cases involving public elementary schools, Perlman considered it an entirely different matter, according to Phil. According to Phil, Perlman was completely unmovable on whether, on the issue of whether the government should in, should intervene on behalf of file on behalf of the NAACP causes in those cases. And um, during that period. Phil, who continued to have uh, regular conversation with Frankfurter, told me that he would speak to Frankfurter about those cases as they were developing. He said because he never believed that um, the U.S. government was going to be involved in those cases um, because Perlman was intransigent. According to Phil, Phil learns during that period of time what the different justices think about from Frankfurter yeah. about the uh, 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 the question of school integration at the elementary school level, and Phil uh, said to me that um, during the course of those conversations, he developed a pretty sophisticated understanding of where the different justices were, not knowing, of course, he said, that um, Perlman wouldn't be there very long, because what happened was that Perlman left, and I won't go into the circumstances under which Perlman left, but, um, but Perlman was replaced. And so after Perlman is replaced, um, he's replaced, I there's a whole series of events involving corruption in the Truman administration and one yeah. person and another um, uh, leaving office, and, and so it comes to somebody named Stern, who ends up as an as a uh, an interim, right. and um, and suddenly we have a new situation 
and Phil is authorized to go ahead and work on a brief in Brown. Right. right. In the meanwhile, I guess, he had been discussing everything about these cases with Frank Berger on the theory that the government was never going to be involved. Today we would say, gee, what are you, nuts? You know, but in those days the standards were different. And so he, he knew where everybody on the court sat, so to speak. And I gather that he and Frankfurt, now, now some people have used phrases like cooked up. Uh, that's probably objectionable to most people to use that phrase. But they sort of mutually began to understand, as I gather it, that you've got to find some way of enabling people on the court to vote against segregated schooling that is divorced from ordering people to integrate now immediately. Because if you, there had to be an order to integrate now, there would never be an order saying that it's illegal to have segregation. The post-war period uh, left us with a lot of unemployment in this country. It left us with uh, returning uh, military people who had been off fighting a war for democracy. And it was very clear that those who had been fighting for human justice around the world were in no mood to come back to their own country and find such things as segregation based on race. It was then that the NAACP, which had been following a program of attacking segregation on a kind of piecemeal uh, basis, decided that there had to be a frontal attack on the so-called separate but equal doctrine. So there are two things I just want to clear away. One is that um, it's not entirely clear that the ethical standards of the day would have condoned oh, okay. what the, you know casual conversations between Phil and Felix Frankfurter on the general subject of civil rights since Phil handled civil rights okay, okay. for the Justice Department. Okay. So I wouldn't want anyone to get the impression that I'm completely comfortable with the ethical, okay. um, with the ethical uh, norms that Phil and Frankfurter had even before Perlman um, uh, left. Uh, right? Okay. So, so that's okay. the first point. Um, the second point is that it, it uh, and I, I think this is, the record will bear this out. I don't think it's fair to say that Felix Frankfurter and Philip Bellman cooked up this together. Um, and the reason I say that is that there are plenty, of the many indications in the historical record that Frankfurter was surprised by the brief that was filed by the government um, and was taken by surprise and, uh, and relief when he saw in the government's brief in the first Brown case, in the first brief in the first Brown case, when Frankfurter sees the brief and he sees that the government takes the position that if the court should find that, um, that Plessy should be overruled, it does not have to grant immediate relief to the plaintiffs in the Brown cases because the plaintiff's briefs in all of the Brown cases all argued that those um, plaintiffs should be entitled to attend integrated schools and should be admitted to the white schools, yeah. right? And uh, gradualism was anathema to the uh, and, uh, and black, uh, black community. I think that's correct. I think that it is, it is um, except for quote unquote incidental delays or necessary delays, uh, the idea that a constitutional right should not be um, should not be linked to a remedy for the plaintiffs asserting the violation of the constitutional right, right. was <coughs> contrary to understood law at that yeah. point. Yeah. Right. So what Phil told me was that he did not talk to Frankfurter about this because he was sure he was going to be disabused by Frankfurter of the possibility of using that as an approach. Right. Because it might be suitable for large mergers and large antitrust cases 
to gradually unwind the merger. But, uh, and there's a book um, called Law's Conscience, I think, by a man named Hoffer, who, who sort of talks at length about this, about this issue. Yeah. But I think that what Phil did in the first brief in Brown, as he saw it, and as I think as others should see it, was unprincipled, um, and yet, in a certain way, brilliant, because it did indeed um, break a log jam on the court. Now, if you ask the question, why was there a, a log jam on the court, it gets to the heart of the controversy, because um, from Phil's perspective, sitting in the SG's office at the time he sat there, um, the NAACP was bringing these cases at a time when the Chief Justice of the court was Vincent, who was a segregationist. And he was bringing, and, and they were bringing the case at a time when there were other votes on the court, certainly, to uphold Plessy. Um, so Reed, for example. I mean, there were clear votes to uphold Plessy, and they were bringing the vote, uh, the, the cases at a time when there were, were justices, as Phil knew, at least as well as anybody, pop possibly better than anybody, although that's also an interesting question as to who else knew who, who could read these votes. I think it wasn't totally a mystery as to who would read the votes. But he was, they were bringing the cases at a time when, from Frankfurter's description, there were possibly only four votes counting Frankfurter to reverse Plessy. The view was, at least, at least from Phil's perspective, Frankfurter felt that Jackson wanted very much to leave it to Congress, um, and that, um, and the number of sure votes was actually not very. Um, you had um, Black, Douglas, and Burton for overruling Plessy, from Frankfurter's count. You had Reed, Clark, and Vinson, who were probably for upholding. And you had um, that left Jackson, Frankfurter, and Mitten as the middle votes. So from Phil Elman's point of view, the question was, how do you, how do you get those three votes, Frankfurter, Jackson, and Mitten, how do you make sure that they vote to overrule Plessy? And the problem from the point of view of the justices, uh, the, the point of view of Frankfurter was uh, that the plaintiffs in the cases only wanted immediate relief and that the, um, even among those who favored reversing um, uh, Plessy, people like Hugo Black were convinced that there would be um, major turmoil in the South and were torn about this themselves, even though they would have voted to reverse Plessy. So from- Which is what happened. Which is subsequently close to what happened, yeah. right? So from, from Phil's point of view, um, inserting in the government brief a, um, a possible remedy which involved gradualism was the approach that would carry the day, okay? Frankfurter was searching for a unanimous court, right? right? Now, um, even if you wanted a majority, um, and this is confirmed, there's a letter that I've seen in the record uh, from Philip Elman to Paul Freund at Harvard. Uh, sharing the brief and explaining that he feared the outcome in Brown um, might be to uphold Plessy or it might well be a split decision which would have the effect of, um, um, or would, might have, as he, s I think the language was a sop to the egalitarians because right. Frankfurter considered Black and Douglas the egalitarians right. and it would be a sop to them yeah. to actually include language uh, which undermined Plessy. But but that was his fear, and that was the first brief. For 25 years, the Massachusetts School of Law has been training great lawyers and building great relationships. Joining MSL was more than just making friends. It was becoming a part of a family, which makes it very difficult to leave. I don't want to leave MSL. We didn't want to leave MSL ever! That's the vision of it! We love MSL, we don't want to leave. The Massachusetts School of Law, 
great lawyers, better people. Come join our family. Visit us today at mslaw.edu. If there is one thing I resolved from the courthouse burning, it was that never would I be like those in the mob. Never would I hate another human being so much that I would kill him and me. Even if it takes years longer, even if the highways are not always wide and smooth, I pray that I shall never crawl toward the promised land on the belly of my spirit, the humanity common to all men transcends race, nationality, and color. As most people who follow this know, um, Frankfurter had a strategy of delay, and uh, he, wanted to, he wanted to delay a decision in the case. Vincent was still the, the Chief Justice, and nobody knew that Vincent would die um, shortly. Um, and so they held over the cases for re-argument. So the court wanted to be briefed on the history of the 14th Amendment. And so there's a, a period of time, a delay, when the clerks and the federal courts and Charles Fairman, the others who are all working on a history of the did 14th Amendment. Did they know, Amendment. did the rest of the justices know, Frankfurter had already had one of his clerks, a guy who became a very famous law professor, Alexander Bickel, do this history already? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. So Frankfurter so. kept it secret while he yeah. had allegedly <laughs> non-interested parties do it. Yeah, okay. Well, it wasn't just Frankfurter at that point. Yeah, it was the okay. court asking yeah. for it. The NAACP went off yeah. doing there was an its order own issue, history. Yeah. There was so an I, order issue. Yeah. That's right. Uh, the brief em emerges, and it actually helps. I mean, it actually helps. And the way in which it helps is it leads the court to envision a compromise. And it's not seen as such because, indeed, there's a division between the remedy right. and the declaration that Plessy is overruled and the place of separate but equal has no place right. in American life. Right, right. Now, technically speaking, Plessy concerned, didn't concern American life. It concerned one thing, grade school. It had an impact on all of American life. Well, there's a kind of an a fortiori argument there, which yeah. is, you know, if separate but equal doesn't fly in an elementary school, where should it fly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A Negro mother speaks. In order to get a better education for our children, we were ready, willing, and anxious to go to other schools. We had been asked that the parents not go to Glendale because of the tension from the parents in Glendale. The schools to which we were going, the parents of those schools did not want our children there. Children from Bedford Stuyvesant's overcrowded schools were being transferred to the spacious ones in Glendale. Some of the parents did not send their children. However, the ones that were anxious for their children to get a good education, they didn't fear anything. Because when you are anxious to achieve something, you forget about fear. When you're ready to make a difference in the world, one law school can make a difference for you. The Massachusetts School of Law is where you learn to become a lawyer. As the most affordable law school in New England, you'll graduate with the most professional skills and the least amount of debt. Our small classes ensure a rich learning experience and a campus environment so special, our students don't want to leave. The Massachusetts School of Law, we're ready to make a difference for you. Visit us today at mslaw.edu. You've got a lot of fantastically interesting stuff in footnotes. It's almost as if you were frightened to put it in text, but you know that's that's just my own craziness about it. Uh, 
where, where guys make these kinds of comments about... Uh, well, I didn't put it in the text because I didn't want any text interfering with Bill's narrative. Okay, yeah. so, right. so that's why it's there in the note. But the, um, but the, uh, I I there are certain justices who, who their clerks now will swear made it a point to be monastic about Brown, who didn't want to hear anything from anybody who wanted nothing to do with any ex parte communication. At which the time. Yes, at the time. So that, you, you know, to believe those clerks, that's what happened. And so that does indeed make it um, um, possible to say, you know what, it wasn't, it wasn't just yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think one has to reckon with the fact that Frankfurter, I, I don't know how to put this nicely, but, but he was a motor mouth of the first order. He could not be stopped from talking about anything. And uh, I'm sure there were other people who understood, let us not mention this, we'll just do it, and we're not gonna talk about it to outsiders. Mm -hmm. Well, I, one of the questions that I, I asked Phil in these interviews, and I, I had frankly not been expecting, I had not been expecting uh, to devote a lot of time to Brown because Richard Kluger had written this classic book called Simple Justice, which, is a, which is a huge and monumental volume, um, highly reliable, and it's a book in which uh, Kluger had interviewed uh, Phil and cites Phil at least, you know, 50 times. So when I'd been preparing to do these interviews with Phil, I thought I was going to be talking mainly about the Federal Trade Commission, and then I it turned out that I learned a lot that because because Richard Kluger had interviewed Phil before Watergate, and I interviewed Phil after Watergate, and I think our whole ethical um, uh, sensitivity changed. And so I don't think I think that explain that to me if you would. Well, I asked Phil. I said, "Here's here's a question that I asked Phil. I said to him, in a post Watergate moral climate, I suppose there's a perspective that might suggest that Frankfurter." was getting a government brief all along from you, which John Davis and others never had a chance to reply to. And I guess my consciousness at the time I did these interviews in 1982 was, you know, there's um, um, y y y all of these you know, judges and ethical rules are, are important and we need to be serious about not having conversations um, with parties who aren't in front of us and so forth. And, um, and Phil's response to me was, you know, I don't have a snappy response to that. That's what he said at the time. He said, I thought this was a cause that transcended the ordinary notions about propriety in a litigation. That's what he said to me. He said, yeah. he said, this was not litigation in the usual sense. The constitutional issue went to the heart of what kind of a country we are, what kind of a constitution we have, and what kind of a Supreme Court we have. So. You, know, you, you cannot, one cannot disagree with that. This was just, this was just too important. Uh, all those things that you just said, what kind of country we have, what kind of, absolutely true. So Now, you know, there's a point of view, I think, that says that because of World War II, because of everything that happened in the 20s and the 30s and then World War II, this would have happened anyway. Well, people say that had it not been for the Civil War, slavery mm -hmm. would have faded away by about 1900 or 1920. I mean, you're talking so about a lot of people and a lot of years. Uh, historians are very, very loath to be reductionist about cause, right? And they don't want, and I think sensitive historiography and sensitive history doesn't reduce um, history to either bottom-up or top-down history. It's not as though social movements immediately and inevitably cause changes that people later look on and say they were inevitable. And it's not as though, um, it's not as though courts act autonomously way ahead of the people. I think that um, sensitive history involves looking at, um, at, at social change as multidimensional. And, um, and to the extent that there are works out there that say, well, Courts don't matter. Um, I think my book actually uh, is some evidence in the to the contrary. I think you know history. History does um, um, depend on the individual choices individual people make. Now Phil talks about God a number of times, and he says God intervened here. I don't think Phil was a particularly religious person. 
I think Phil is just, y you may as well say chance intervened uh, at some level. But when Vinson died, right, when Vinson died and Earl Warren became the Chief Justice of the court, um, the, the whole deck of cards changed. The whole deck of ch cards changed. The NAACP couldn't have known about that when they brought those cases in 1950. Phil couldn't have known about that. And there's a wonderful and sort of wry um, story. Um, uh, Phil tells it in the first person about uh, uh, Vincent died in England and there's a funeral and Phil is getting off the train and, uh, uh, excuse me, Frankfurter gets off the train and Phil meets him. Um, this, is, this is Vincent's funeral and, and Frankfurter has a big beaming glow on his face, <laughs> you know, and and Phil says, well, what's going on? And Frankfurter beams and he says, I'm in mourning. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he says to Phil, Phil, you know, this is the first piece of evidence I've ever seen that there really is a God. You know, I, I read that and I've known about it before and you just don't know what to say. You j I mean, I don't know what to say. Was this a very fortunate, did it eventually turn out to be an extremely fortunate thing for the country? I think so. And yet to say that the death of a guy is the first evidence he's ever seen, that if it had been Hitler or Tojo, I might have understood. Well, it does tell you something about just what proportion Frankfurter gave to achieving, yeah, achieving an end to segregation. True. I mean, I, I mean, you, you, you know, when you think about it, there in a way, it speaks well for Frankfurter. Yeah, in 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 a way, in a, in, I mean, but it's not out of character with all these nasty, well, if I can say these sort of nasty notes and right. the, the insults and and the ridicule and and the sarcasm. I mean, you know, Frankfurter dripped sarcasm. How, how did Phil put up with that kind of stuff? Because he wasn't that kind of guy, was he? Um, uh, I think sarcasm came naturally to Phil. Oh. Well, there's a there's a wonderful uh, moment. In, you know, Phil handled antitrust cases yeah. for the uh, SG's office. He was he he brought he argued most of the antitrust yeah. cases in front of the of the court, and that had an impact on his selection as a tr trade commissioner later. But in one of those cases, they were debating um, the uh, antitrust exemption for um, uh, baseball. Right. And and uh, Minton is questioning Phil because he doesn't he doesn't uh, uh, see the distinction between baseball and football. <laughs> One wouldn't. <laughs> Why you know? And uh, and so and so Minton is sort of uh, saying y you know well uh, you know in baseball the plays the thing uh, the, the the games the thing and uh, I suppose and and, and Minton says. Well, I yeah, I see it. He said, you know, in 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 theater, I guess the play's the thing. And Phil says, uh, Justice Minton, I think when Shakespeare wrote wrote that, he didn't have the Sherman Antitrust Act in mind. <laughs> and Minton is apparently, y y you know, so so angry he could throw the pencil at him. Yeah. And Frankfurter's beaming like that's my boy, you know. <laughs> and and uh, so there's a streak of in Phil, I think of 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 that kind of hard-boiled You know, a, a similar story quality. you tell, I, I don't remember the details, but once Phil put down Frankfurter, mercilessly, I gather, and he looks around and he catches Douglas's eye and Douglas winks at him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there were enemies all over that bench. <laughs> yeah. The NAACP had been instrumental in winning the most significant civil rights victory since the end of slavery. As far as the impact of uh, the decision, uh, Brown versus uh, Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, had, it simply meant that the system under which thousands and thousands of Negroes had been educated prior to that time, was uh, dumped out the window. Randall Kennedy is a professor at Harvard, African-American, 
I grew up in Washington, D.C., right near where my kids used to live. Even knew the Ullman family, although he didn't realize that until later after he wrote what I'm going to talk about. Played tennis with young Ellman. And just blasted Ellman for the things he did when it came to Brown versus the board and everything surrounding it. And, uh, you know, S Elman had said, and he blasted Elman in particular, because Elman had said that he, Elman, thought that Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP had not known what they were doing. They brought the wrong cases in the wrong places at the wrong time, and they didn't understand, and I think this was the, the most important part of it, they didn't understand, as he did, presumably through his conversations with Frankfurt, or however innocent they may have been, what the lay of the land was in the court, and mm -hmm. what you had to do to win, and what if you did, if you did something else, you were going to lose and set back the movement for years. And Randall Kennedy just blasted that and said it was Frankfurter's own fears, it was Elman was too cocksure of his own view, blah, blah, blah. What's your take on this whole thing? Well, it's a complicated question. Uh, the, the, the first thing I would say is that um, uh, Randall Kennedy did more than that. He, 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 he went further to say that the, and th remember, this is a response not to the book, but this is a response to the article that first came out. Oh, yeah, long before the book. Long before the book. Yeah. And, and um, Randall Kennedy said that Phil's uh, demeaning and condescending attitude about the NAACP lawyers said more about his attitudes about race than it did about the NAACP. Can I put it bluntly? Yeah. Randall Kennedy was saying that Elman was a racist. He didn't think that black lawyers could be any damn good. Yes, and I think that's a fair, that's a fair summary of what Kennedy wrote in the response yeah. that was generated to the article that showed up in the Harvard Law Review. And, and uh, Phil wrote a rejoinder to the response. I didn't bring that, but Phil wrote a rejoinder to the response which said, essentially, the answer to that is my whole life. Yep. He said, um, y y you know, everything I said about their strategy is true and undeniable. He responded to the claims uh, about the NAACP as having, having, um, having, I mean, Kennedy suggested that the NAACP had urged, had accepted a gradualist remedy, and I think Phil made quick work of that. He basically, um, he ba I, I don't think anybody who's read those pieces could say that, um, um, and, and I think Mark Tushnet even later corroborated. And, and one has to remember that Marshall and NAACP, when they started in 1930, they were confronted by a mountain. Right. Well, that's right. And, and uh, y you know, and I think, uh, as I said, I think Mark Tushnet had a better response than Randall Kennedy on these grounds. I think he conceded um, that Phil had indeed um, made that argument, made that argument uh, when the NAAC, NAACP had no interest in making that argument, right? And as to race, racism and the allegations of racism, Phil said, well, the answer to that is my whole life, which was um, true in many ways. He had spent his life working um, to promote civil rights and to end uh, segregation. And in later, later, when I interviewed Randall Kennedy about how he responded or thought about his response years later, he said, you know, I was over the top. I think that's a quote. I was over the top. He said, you know, um, Phil was on the right side of history. And indeed, he, indeed he, um, he uh, wrote an, a book review of this book, which he, he, he said, I don't take anything back about uh, my comments about how he, was, he mistreated the black lawyers. Um, but it was, it, it was lodged at a professional level. It was about professional strategy, and it was about lawyering and craft. And, um, and I do think that Phil um, uh, really felt strongly, and he didn't retract any of his comments about lawyering or craft or the litigation strategy that the, that the NAACP uh, uh, adopted. The other thing I should say is that Kennedy said it was unfair to treat the 
NAACP as having, should have had knowledge to count the votes because they didn't have the ability to talk to Frankfurter the way Phil had talked to Frankfurter. Well, um, Phil pointed out to me in, in, in a letter, which I don't think he, it's not in the book, but Phil pointed out to me that, of course, William Coleman was a Frankfurter clerk who was also having conversations, and he was also working with the NAACP. Whether or not William Coleman shared, um, shared that information with the NAACP, I don't yeah, think. Uh, we should say that uh, William Coleman was one of the country's most famous black lawyers. He ultimately became Secretary of Commerce, I think it was. I actually dealt with him on one or two things, but he was regarded as a very, very brilliant lawyer. Yeah. The 1954 decision spurred the NAACP and other activist groups to challenge segregation in housing, transportation, and public facilities. Marches and sit-ins led to the arrest of many demonstrators. Roy Wilkins became executive director of the NAACP in 1955, and it was clear that there was much work yet to do to gain true equality. Not only the laws, but the attitudes and traditions of segregation had to be overcome. When Roy Wilkins assumed the leadership of the NAACP, the full impact of the Supreme Court school desegregation decision was felt. Unfortunately, there were many people, high government officials in the state, who mobilized the virtual arsenal of uh, types of frustration to try to prevent that decision from being implemented. We had the scene of a governor of one state, the governor of the state of Arkansas, using the armed forces of that state to prevent black children from going to public schools. Roy Wilkins, at the helm of the NAACP, had to meet and deal with all of those problems. The story was getting across to America and to the world that the Negro was a human being was an American citizen presumably possessing inalienable rights which were being grievously and bestially violated, and that the proud and free America could hardly hold its head high enough to escape the stench. Did we have courts? And to what end? Did we have a constitution? For whom? What of our vaunted slogan, equal justice, under law. Massachusetts School of Law. Legal education that is practical, accessible, affordable, and enjoyable. Offering flexible day and evening classes, full or part-time studies, where candidates are assessed not on the LSAT, but their academic and other accomplishments. Providing more professional skills training than any other law school in New England. Massachusetts School of Law. Visit us at mslaw.edu training students to become successful lawyers and advocates, not just legal scholars. The idea that the um, NAACP wasn't trying to understand the votes, I think, is, um, is itself questionable. I think, I think well, it's highly it goes unlikely. It two ways, doesn't it, Norman? Because from the standpoint of people like Marshall, you were starting in 1920, as I said, with a mountain. Every case and everything was against you, and you just had it chip away, chip away, chip away. And when, 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 when Phil saw it, well, they'd already chipped away to the point where, where, you know, now you're getting to the Supreme Court, and it's getting to be close to the whole ballgame. I think, I think there is a lot to what you're saying, and I think there's more to be said about the difference between the actual plaintiff, the actual litigant who's bringing test litigation, and the U.S. Justice Department, right? Yeah. So, so, um, and and the NAACP is trying as best as it can to bring along a social movement, yeah. and it has to do that in a whole different way. So that while Phil can be sitting there at this SG's office counting votes social reform organizations and, move, and movement leadership have to be thinking about a whole other right, set of they've considerations. Got a, they've got the whole mountain to think about, and they've got, I hate to put it this way, but they've got, they've got the problem of raising money. But it doesn't, in, in, in many ways, in my view anyway, it doesn't undermine um, the testimony Phil is giving about yeah. what really brought Brown about. 
and why it is that the formula which became known as the all deliberate speed formula, why that formula was necessary even though it was, as Phil says, unprincipled and even though it led to uh, uh, several decades of social upheaval. But isn't it fascinating, Norman, that a guy who is described in the book and in everything I've ever read or heard as being this an ultra moral human being confessed he had to do something that he himself thinks is unprincipled in order for this cause to, you know, cause to succeed. Well, let's not, I mean, there, I don't want to confuse two different points. The, that which he confessed to being unprincipled is the idea that there should be an equitable remedy to a constitutional wrong. Okay. So when he says that's unprincipled, what he's saying is that it was contrary to legal doctrine up to that point. Yeah, okay, so fair that's enough. the thing that was unprincipled. When he says he was not saying that my, that, that my, that I, he did not ever um, accede to the notion that he committed a grievous ethical impropriety in terms of his ex parte <coughs> communication. Okay, okay. He, he, you know, he, he later said to me that he, his, his comments to me in the original interview were ambiguous and that, you know, and he, he said that I understood my ethical responsibility as being not to talk to Frankfurter about the case I was current, that was currently pending. Right, right, right. And I didn't talk to him about Brown once I knew that, pro that the government would intervene. Right, right. Other ethics scholars subsequently have said, well, that's not a correct understanding of his ethical obligations at that right. time. Right, right. He never said that. And I think in truth, ethics have, w what are considered appropriate ethics have changed dramatically from those days. Uh, it's much more, is it Portia these days, you know? Mm -hmm. Got it, you have to appear uh, holier than holy. Uh, anyway, okay. After this, you know, F uh, Elman got appointed to the Federal Trade Commission. He did a lot of, he, he was appointed to uh, actually bring the commission closer to up to snuff from being a, you know, a, a cesspool. And he did the best he could, and he had a lot of problems there because he was confronted by political hacks, to put it candidly. I was in Washington in those days, so I would hear about it. But, uh, you know, he, he did okay then. And then he, uh, he worked a little while as a private lawyer. But, uh, you know, you get the sense his heart was never really in any of it because when you get right down to it, Phil Elman was born to be an anti a, 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 a Supreme Court lawyer in his Solicitor General's office. That's where he shone, that's where his interest was, that's where his uh, morality, his writing ability, so many things which don't count in private practice, you know, were of the essence up there. Well, um, I do think there are a couple of pivotal moments in his career. And um, one such moment is uh, the uh, 19, is the year 1960. And 1960, of course, is the year of the Kennedy election. Well, the, 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 the race between Nixon and Kennedy. Phil had been a very close friend of Phil Graham. And Phil right. Graham from was the editor in chief of the Law Review his year, right? And he and the Phil, Playboy editor in chief. <laughs> oh, the, the story of Phil Graham is is a, an amazing story, yeah, and yeah, and I mean yeah. I don't know if, if you know much about him, but yeah, well I do, and he was a brilliant guy. He grew up on a houseboat, yeah, in uh, in the Florida Everglades, and his mother on her on her dying on her deathbed told Phil Graham uh, that she wanted him to go to the best law school he could get into, uh, the best law school in the United States. And um, Phil's father, after the mother died, saw this as, a, as an obligation and, and went to Claude Pepper, Senator Claude Pepper, and Pepper got Phil Graham into Harvard. And the rest is history. Uh, had a very troubled life, but also a very successful life, close to the Kennedys. Yes. And um, Phil Graham thought, uh, you know, Phil could have gone on in the SG's office. He could have continued in the SG's office. But, um, he was career and he was 
he was able to help Republicans in, in the Eisenhower administration, after all. Um, so, so in 1960, Bill Graham writes a letter um, urging Kennedy to appoint, um, appoint uh, Phil to watch over his brother Bobby Kennedy right. as head of the Office of Legal Counsel. Right, right. From which Scalia has Tom and John Roberts and Scal uh, 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 Alito and God knows how many people. Yeah. Rehnquist. Yeah. So, so um, Bobby Kennedy has an inter interviews him. Yeah. He goes through all of the uh, FBI clearance uh, uh, procedures. Bobby Kennedy interviews him and there's this extraordinarily awkward, 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 awkward interview in which Bobby Kennedy asks Phil Elman about his grades in college, in law school. And yeah, 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 you, you 30, know, and 25 years ago. According to Phil, it's pretty clear that Bobby Kennedy is chafing at the idea that his brother Jack and Phil Graham thinks he needs watching over by some, uh, by some uh, sort of father figure who's going to watch over him as he's attorney general. And um, that's at least the way Phil conveyed it to me. Um, so, uh, so Robert Kennedy said thank you very much, and uh, basically killed it. Um, as as, uh, but on the other hand, there's a lot of there, there's actually there's actually source material that suggests that Robert Kennedy then recommended Phil for one of the regulatory agencies, and that's what happened. Now, Oxford, Mississippi, which is made this whole question of the federal government and education more sensitive in some parts of the country. I suppose that's going to be a factor against us. I don't, I don't uh, really know uh, what other role uh, they would expect the President of the United States to play. The court, made up of Southern judges, determined that it was according to the Constitution that Mr. Merritt go to the University of Mississippi. The governor of Mississippi uh, did, uh, opposed it, and uh, there was uh, rioting uh, against Mr. Merritt, which endangered his life. We sent in marshals. And after all, 150 or 60 marshals were wounded one way or another out of four or 500, and at least three-fourths of the marshals were from the South themselves. And then we sent in troops when it appeared that the marshals were going to be overrun. I don't think that uh, anybody who looks at the situation could think we could possibly do anything else. We could possibly do anything else. But on the other hand, I recognize that it's caused a lot of bitterness against uh, me and against the national government in Mississippi and other parts. Uh, and uh, though they expect me to carry out my oath, Constitution, and that's what we're going to do, but it does make it more difficult to pass an education bill. But I think we shouldn't penalize this great resource of our youth for all these reasons. Instead, we ought to do the job and get some, and, and get these schools built, these teachers compensated, and higher education available to all these boys and girls. And every time I drive around the country, that's all you see are six and seven and eight and nine-year-old children who are going to be pouring into our schools and colleges, and every governor will tell you that's his major problem, providing educational facilities where the national government has responsibility. Why was he never made a judge? I mean, he's the kind of guy, well, I don't know, Danny Friedman became a judge. Mm -hmm. I guess Fritzer didn't, he, he stayed as a law professor, Posner became a judge. Anyhow, a lot of people in the SG's office became judges, not everybody, some mm -hmm. went on, quote, merely to highly successful academic or practice careers. Mm -hmm. Uh, why did Elman never become a judge? Well, you could go further than that and say that almost everybody associated with success in the Brown case, with the winning side in the Brown case, became a judge. Uh, yeah, Marshall, like Robert Elman. Carter. Motley. I mean, you, yeah. you know, a couple of reasons, at least three reasons. One is uh, Frankfurter, and probably principally, Frankfurter had a stroke, 1961. Even from his hospital bedroom, Frankfurter was trying to get Phil a district court judgeship. Um, but, uh, but his, Frankfurter's power and influence had waned at that point. Um, <coughs> okay, so what was reason number two? Reason number two is that the gradualist remedy um, uh. um, had become a bit of a liability, being associated with having created that gradualist remedy and having alienated um, the same groups that should have supported him or would have supported him otherwise, um, that was a huge, a huge uh, liability as well. Um, and the third is the actual um, hostility, perhaps because he was terribly acerbic, um, 
the, the hostility of people uh, who um, were in a position at this point uh, to, um, uh, to recommend him or not to, Earl Warren, for example. So, so um, his mm. widow, Ella, asked me that question when I saw her when the book was, Who did? Uh, when the book debuted, Phil's wife, oh. Ella, asked me the question that you asked me. Mm. She said the one thing I never understood is why he didn't become a judge. He was, uh, he would have been perfect for it and he was, he, it was something he wanted. Um, and I think that is a sad, it's a sad, it's a sad it aspect. Is, it is, and you know, in reading, in reading it, Norman, it brought to mind something I've thought for decades. Doesn't apply to me, but it, I've thought it for decades. There is such a thing as being too smart for your own good. To people who are too smart, they tend to aggravate people because if they speak up, because you know. People just don't like to be put down, out argued, this, that, the other. Mm. He did have a great career uh, that subsequently as a Federal Trade Commissioner. And as you said, he became a legend in terms of uh, as a craftsman and as an appellate yeah. craftsman and a maverick dissenter. Um, on the commission, he really led to the rebirth. People like Robert Potofsky and, yeah. and uh, Mike Perchuk yeah. consider him to have basically helped to recreate. Right, right. Maybe names not known to the general public that's mm -hmm. going to watch this show, but to those of us who follow what in Europe is called competition law, and it's becoming called that everywhere these days, yeah. or more so than it used to be in the United States, uh, these are very well-known names and very well-known people. Now, I actually knew Potowski at one point. Uh, uh, anyhow, Norman, I want to thank you. Uh, I, I'm so happy that somehow or other, for reasons I don't know and when I don't know, I ran across the fact that you had written a book on Phil Ellman, and I said, this is for me. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, yeah. And to the audience, thank you, and be with us again for the next episode of Books of Our Time. Mm -hmm.